let's start the topic uh, for today's discussion is insulin initiation titration and intensification it is really really important see uh, whenever patients comes to especially a uh, diabetologist he has been seen by many gps general practitioners and most of the time blood sugars are not controlled and insulin is not initiated by a family physician or a general practitioner because he is not confident enough to start insulin and also if he starts insulin he does not know how to titrate it and then the patient has like ki i am already taking insulin still my blood sugars are not controlled and then there are many dropouts discontinuation of the insulin so this is really important topic that is why i want to discuss this how to initiate insulin what we take into consideration while prescribing insulin what are the type of insulin how to prescribe it how to titrate it like how to increase the dose and intensification means that when you want to add from a basal to a bolus that basal bolus multiple injection when do you want to go for that so that is the base of today's lecture so just this is an interactive session so this would be a question answer type i'll ask and you can just comment or you can even come live no issue so what do you feel that how is overall glycemic control in a indian patient whether you feel it is good enough or we are lagging behind so you can comment in a question answer session because it's an interactive session okay uh, till everybody is answering we have a question here i'll answer that also so fasting and pp within target range on oha but hba1c high uh, should we switch to insulin obviously not see you have to see hba1c whether it is from a reliable lab or not whether it has been performed by an hplc method or not secondly usually this happens that okay everything hblc is from a good lab which is uh, ngsp certified and is from an hplc method everything is still it is high because the patient is taking too many sweets or patient is missing his ohs so what will happen that his fasting and pp whenever he checks it would be normal but his hblc would be high so this uh, we'll discuss in few another lecture where i'll be discussing about cgms so something there we can pick it up very easily so we have few answer here yes yes poorly controlled that is very correct answer here if you will see the data most like even if you will go for the latest study which is the indian diet study which showed which is uh, in many of the states of india showed that our control is poor the average hbnc if you pick up any study it is somewhere between 8 to 9% hbnc so that is not what is recommended like even if you have comorbidities no but no where it is like 9% even with comorbidity it is somewhere around 7.5 to 8% and if patient does not have comorbidity if the patient is young we want it somewhere around 6.5 to 7% hbnc so yes our glycemic control is poor and after even that poor glycemic control also our insulinization is even poorer because if you see the data almost 50% of the patient who have diabetes do not know that they have diabetes those who are on treatment only one third one third that is 30 to 35% of the patient actually meets the glycemic targets so almost like 2/3 or up to 70% 75% of the patient do not meet the glycemic control targets and on that also only one in four patient that is only 25% of the patients who are on insulin meet the glycemic control so even on insulin we are not performing well that is because of the issue of titration because it's not titrated you start in your initiation you do the insulinization but you do not increase the dose as required so that is the problem so why this topic we are discussing because there is physician inertia despite poor glycemic control which i have already discussed the physician is also reluctant to start insulin obviously the patient is reluctant to start insulin he will always say you just see this time next time i will control my sugar this time i have something like uh, i had this party or there was a family uh, function so something like that he'll give an excuse or uh, because of cold i could not walk or something like that he'll tell and physician will also say okay let's see next time the, the patient will also see let's see next time so next time will never come and the uh, glycemia will remain poor so there is great inertia both at the level of physician and at the level of patient then lack of time if you see the average time of patient 
like uh, in your opd how much time you give to the patient it is somewhere around 2 to 3 minutes not more than that so in that time you have to counsel the patient you have to ask the problems of the patient you have to explain about insulin and all those things and you have to make him understand that it is required so lack of time is something very important in indian scenario because it's not like we are practicing in such a way that we give 20 minutes to each and every patient right so that is a big problem lack of time that is why also insulin is not initiated and it is easy for the physician also okay we'll see next time and the patient is also very happy that the doctor has not started insulin so that is another one big problem then lack of knowledge like which insulin to initiate at what dose and how to treat it that is again a big problem because you don't know that how to initiate insulin and which insulin would be the best for this patient so lack of knowledge also we try to push a little bit later on we'll start that is again a problem then perceived complications of the insulin by the patient that is again a problem because there there is a, a, a mindset in our indian patient that this insulin may damage his kidney may damage his eyes and that is because the insulin was initiated later on in his uh, relative who already had this complication so he believed that this insulin actually caused all those complications so most of your patient will be very reluctant to start insulin because they were false perception that this insulin will lead to complication that is again a problem then some of the patient who have initiated but at the beginning in at the beginning by i mean uh, within one month if they have hypoglycemia then again there are very high dropout and now we have data to back it up that if there is hypoglycemia within first month of initiation the dropout rate is very high patient does not continue so that is again to be seen then non availability of patient education so we don't have all those things uh, a team a backup team where the patient is handhold for insulin initiation titration because most of the clinic there is just a doctor and he will uh, write insulin and the patient even does not know how to inject insulin so that's a big problem then non acceptability by the patient because see right from the beginning since you would recall right in the beginning whenever you go to a hospital when you were a kid your parents would say that just sit quiet don't be uh, make uh, too much noises otherwise the doctor will give you an injection so that fear of injection is actually deep embedded in our brain so same way the patient is like uh, not willing for a injectable therapy whether you talk about insulin or whether you talk about injectable glp1 analog that is a big issue so these are the problems and that is uh, that is what we are going to talk about how to tackle all these problem and how to do the initiation titrations okay so this is just a basic most of you would be knowing this but again i'll tell and i have included this in my one of my lecture also so there are basically two types of insulin you can say one is the conventional insulin one is analog insulin in analog insulin we have changed slightly modified something in the basic insulin and these are analogs which may be faster acting or may be longer acting so there are two types of insulin in both conventional as well as the newer analog insulin short acting and long acting short acting insulin <coughs> we have this the regular one this is the conventional insulin which you'll get by various name like uh, the most common one is hum insulin r insugen r so names are also important because see sometimes you get confused that what is the insulin in uh, and what is the uh, actually molecule so name also you must know so insugen r hum insulin r vosulan r all those are are actually short acting regular insulin so these are the regular insulin then we have this nph which is intermediate that is a conventional longer acting insulin then we have analogs in analogs we have short acting or rapid acting here you have lispro aspart and glulysine okay so this aspart is now further modi uh, modified into faster acting aspart which comes by the name of fiast where is this aspart original aspart comes by the name of novo rapid then lispro you have as eglucent and humalog okay 
and this glue lysine you have as epidrop. So these are actually uh, produced by different companies. Okay, so these are analogs and the latest one we have this FIASP, which actually works very fast. It start working within two minutes and this is the insulin which you can give even after food. Like let's say a, a small kid is there and he has erratic dietary pattern because uh, you may not be knowing but these kids are really uh, troublesome to handle because once you inject insulin then they will not eat something so that they have hypo and when they have hypo they will get uh, sweets. So some kids are doing like that also. So this PS is really good in them because you can give even after meal like if the patient if the kid had uh, two chapatis then this many units three chapatis then all those things also i'll discuss how to do carb counting so this fias we have now data which shows that even if you get after 20 minutes of the meal it is equally effective so that is really good okay then we have this long acting detimer detimer comes by the name of levimer so this insulin is actually a good insulin in GDM patients. And this, if you can see here, the uh, duration of action is somewhere around 12 to 16 hours. If you'll see here, it drops down by 12 hours. So that is why this has to be given twice a day in most of the time. In most of your GDM, you have to give this two times a day detriment. Then you have this glargin, which was actually originally the... Uh, uh, Pioneer one is the Lantus that is from Sanofi, but now we have various biosimilar uh, like the Besalog, Besaglar, then Glaritus, all those from the Bucart and many companies are coming with this Glargin insulin. Okay, one insulin I have not put here that is Degludec. Okay, that comes by the name of Treciba. Okay, this is from a Novo and this is even longer than this glargin. Glargin, somewhere around it works between 16 to 22 hours, whereas this Treciba works up to 24 hours and may work beyond that also. So that is another degludec insulin. And also now we have different strength of insulin. If you talk about glargin, so now you have two strengths, U100. U100, that means that there are 100 units in per ml. Then you have this U300. That means that 300 units per ml of insulin. So this U U300 is a newer. These are second generation analogs, basal insulin. So this Treciba and U300, which comes by the name of Tougio, okay, or Tougio, T-O-U-J-E-O. -E this is the U300 insulin. So with this, I have told you almost all the insulin and see, if you'll see here the time, if like, let's say, assume an example where uh, the patient is a businessman or is uh, working somewhere where he has a lunch break of, let's say, half an hour. So it's really impossible for him to inject an insulin 20 minutes before, which you have to do in a regular conventional short acting insulin. And after 15 to 20 minutes, you have to take the meal. But that patient actually has a lunch break of only half an hour. So he cannot do that. So for him, a rapid analog insulin would, would be very good. You should prescribe him fiasco because he'll inject and he will directly eat within two minutes. And that is good enough for him because he has a lunch break of only half hour. So these are some practical points which should be kept in mind. And for that, you need a detailed history of the patient that what he is doing, when he is doing, what is his job profile, how much time he is eating, when he is eating, how much amount he is eating, what is the pattern of his diet, how much he wants to like... Uh, like variability he wants, like if this, if you'll talk about this Treciba insulin, now we have data to back it up that almost like 40 hours difference also, if you'll keep, it will work almost same. Like in Glargin, you tell your patient, in Lantus, you tell your patient that you have to inject at the same time. Let's say in evening or morning, whenever you want, I put that question, so also we'll discuss that also. So you say your patient, irrespective of taking food, like whether you're taking a meal or not, or you're delaying your meal, but this long acting basal insulin is to be taken at the same time. Like 9 p.m., you can just move it not more than half an hour. Okay, that is what we say our patient for this glargin and long acting. But for Treciba, 
we give them flexibility of six hours like if a patient wants he can inject in the afternoon or at night it won't matter it will work the same way so that is the feasibility we want we are giving to our patients okay so these things are rapidly changing with this 2g o uh, u300 uh, the flexibility is around of 3 hours so that is good enough like a patient can inject somewhere between 6 pm to 9 pm that is also good okay so these are something important points which you must know and also your patient must know firstly if you talk about the vials these are vials they come in two strengths 40 and 100 okay so 40 and 100 iu per ml that means in 1 ml you have 40 units of insulin whereas in 100 you have 100 units of insulin in per ml so that is important and whatever while he is using the same syringe he should use if he is using the 41 he should use a 40 unit this insulin syringe and this comes by the rat cap if he is using this 101 here it may not be very visible so he should use a 100 unit syringe and this comes as a orange topped the cap is of orange color that is how we differentiate important thing almost all cartridge comes as a strength of 100 units so what happens is sometimes the pen is not working and the patient injects with the syringe and then sometimes he uses this syringe because that is the syringe most commonly available at the nearby shops usually the chemists don't keep this 100 unit syringes if you are talking about district places and all those most of the places it is just the 40 unit strength syringe available so what happens that the patient takes this cartridge and he uses this 40 unit syringe to inject to take that insulin from that cartridge okay so what happens that almost 2.5 times the dose is taken because see this works in ml right so here if you will take 1 ml that is 40 unit but since you have taken it from an 100 uh, unit uh, cartridge right 100 strength cartridge so this 1 ml will come now as 100 unit that means 2.5 times the dose is injected so if the patient has taken 10 units from this syringe actually he has injected 25 units okay one quick question for you that uh, you don't sleep and be awake what do you think which is a uh, more potent insulin a uh, 40 unit or a 100 unit just answer on q and a or uh, this uh, chat box what do you think okay we have a question here ectrapid ectrapid is also a short acting regular insulin same this is just the names that you must know ectrapid insujan then hum this is insujan n and insujan r so insujan r would come here hum insulin r vosulin r all those are short acting regular insulin okay one question treciba can work up to 48 hours yes it can work up to even 72 hours but there are studies that it causes less of hypoglycemia because the effect is peakless okay okay so we have answers for everything that 40 is of uh, higher strength and somebody said it same somebody said 100 unit is more active so that that was a basic question c again i'll tell you so if you talk about it is like a question that 1 kg whether 1 uh, kg of uh, gold is heavier or 1 kg of cotton is heavier when you talked about this question see you have already specified 1 kg 1 kg cotton the volume would be very very high in 1 kg gold the volume would be very low but 1 kg means 1 kg it's the same thing right similarly it is just the strength that in 1 ml you have 40 unit of insulin and here in 1 ml you have 100 unit of insulin but one unit is one unit you get that it is more uh, in a volume uh, less of volume more unit that is what is here 100 units international units per ml but the strength if you talk about one unit it is the same whether you take off 40 or 100 one unit means one unit okay so let's 
go forward these are some uh, important things which you need to discuss with your patient that how to inject and where all he can inject so he can inject over abdomen in the u fashion then he have to inject over the outer aspects of the arm even this this part can be utilized that is the upper and outer part of the gluteus then outer and lateral of this thighs so this is important because sometimes we see patient injecting in calves on the medial side all those things we know and forearm so that is not to be done then technique that is also important that he should first clean the area then take a pinch and at 90 degree he should hold his this syringe and then he inject now this new work when you are talking this is about the syringe but when you are talking about pens so this pens the needle is very short and you can even without pinching also can use it in obese patient but in thin and lean patient we usually ask them to pinch and use but even if they don't it does not matter much for the pens where the needle uh, that uh, needle is very small but in this syringes it has to be done this way only so that is important then you have to tell about priming okay that is important so priming is when you are taking this insulin in the syringe two units you have to discard first and then you have to inject that is important then <clears throat> you have to tell about 10 second rule that is after injecting he should count for 10 seconds and then he should remove this syringe or the pen because see uh, this insulin is actually very high strength medicine if you talk about in 1 ml you have 100 units if you are talking about pen right almost all pen have this except for few like you have u200 u300 all those are there even u500 is available so there are this but in general it is 100 units per ml so 1 ml has 100 units and when you are injecting 10 units let's say that means you are injecting just 0.1 ml or let's say even less if you are injecting 6 units that means 0.06 ml of insulin you are injecting and that's like very very minute amount if some of this comes out like you inject and directly remove your pen then the dose won't go that much and your sugars will go up and down the patient will be falsely having hypos and hypers because whenever he has this less of insulin injected you will in increase the dose and then he when sometimes he injects it properly the whole dose will go and patient will have hypo and it would be really tough for us to understand why his sugars are fluctuating so much so technique is really really important then what happens this needles are actually coated with silicon coating okay so ideally it should be used only for a single prick but then it would be really costly affair because even the syringes cost around let's say 7 to 10 rupees and the needle cost around somewhere around 10 to 15 rupees so injecting every time you know, obviously the insulin cost is totally different this is just about the syringes and the needles so if he changes every time that is what ideally should be done the cost would increase drastically so what we ask in practical is you can inject for three times then you discard your this needle and you change it so at least three times we he can use but not beyond that and we see patient in and out who are using till that cartridge is completely finished sometimes it even goes for a month so that is totally wrong now what will happen if he is using the same needle for a month what will happen firstly it will not deliver properly because the tip would be getting blunted secondly you will increase the chances of infection you will increase the chances of lipo hypertrophy okay the local place because of the blunt injury also and also once you inject this uh, needle and when you uh, just take it out some of the subcutaneous tissue is actually attached to it so the delivery actually alters so that is important all those things important practical aspects that need to be considered while prescribing and while explaining your patients okay what other than that you have to know if a patient is already on insulin or if you are initiating insulin these are the things you should discuss with your patient i have also discussed this in the practical approach to uh, diabetic patient in our cpcd mod uh, module so here you have to know what 
amount of total insulin he is taking and what amount of per kg insulin he is taking okay because that is important basal insulin should not be uh, going beyond 0.5 units per kg then that is over basalization and you have to add a uh, bolus to the basal regime okay then what type or whatever we have discussed already then pen and syringe you have to ask your patient what he is comfortable with because cost will drastically change not only the pen would be costing more the insulin the cartridge of the pen would be costing almost three times okay so in all the patient would be uh, having almost thrice the cost if you will talk about syringes versus pen if you are giving him regular or nph for a uh, patient who is not very well affording here you will get almost at 130 rupees you will get 400 units okay and in if you will talk about the cartridge okay this cartridge if you will talk about so even the regular insulin i am talking about not the analog the regular insulin will also cost the 300 units would cost around 500 to 600 rupees depending on what brand you are using so you will see here the 400 units in 130 rupees whereas in 300 unit less than that almost three times cost the patient would be paying and then the syringes are cheaper than the needle of the pen so that all those things you have to understand and make your patient understand because this is not a, like he'll be taking insulin for one month one year if most of the time once you initiate he's he's going to take it for lifetime and then that's really important to discuss right at the beginning okay then regime we will be coming to that then whether he will be injecting self and also you have to tell others the relative how to inject because the patient if has severe hypoglycemia severe hypoglycemia that means he become unconscious whether when he needs the help of other uh, person to recover from hypoglycemia glucagon is something which is important okay and this glucagon is actually injected like a insulin okay so that also you have to tell your patients okay and the relative that is important then site of injection we have already discussed time in relation to the meal that is important like for the basal i have told you you have to tell him like fixed timing for the uh, bolus insulin you have to tell him according to insulin if you are talking about analog five minutes or 10 minutes depending on what analog you are using if you are using regular insulin then 15 to 20 minutes before the meal so that all things you need to discuss okay then well, you have, if the patient is already on insulin, you have to ask whether he is missing insulin or not because most of your patient will be missing and now we have data. Even from the Western data, it shows that four times the patient misses the insulin in a month. So like Indian patient, I believe, misses more. Okay. Then where he has bought insulin, that is important. Sometimes what happens when patient changes the cartridge or the vial, sugars were going previously very good very fine now the blood sugars are raising to very high range and we don't understand why the common problem is that he has bought from uh, a local shop or more importantly now that everything is online we are also teaching you online only so this online trend is now picking up in pharmacy also because of the higher amount of discount and sometimes what happens the cold chain is actually not maintained and so what they are injecting is a less potent insulin or even it's not even now insulin just a simple water behaving like a water it's not at all working so that is important that needs to be seen and asked each and every patient if the sugars were well controlled before and now they are not controlled on the same dose so you have to think why why it is happening okay so that is important then expiry date is to be checked again this is a problem with the online thing because what happens that in this bulk purchases the people buy too many insulin because they are getting a higher discount and that amount of insulin is actually not uh, utilized by them and that is expired and the patient keeps on using it so that is again a big problem so that you have to discuss then storage that is important you have to tell your patient and or ask your patient who is already on insulin whether he has refrigerator or not and if let's say he has a refrigerator whether there is electricity or not for the hours or like sometimes in especially rural area they have electricity for 12 hours and they don't have for 12 hours 
so that is again a problem so for that we say a patient that what can be done um, let let me just brief uh, that also that is important because if you are working in a rural area that is really important so what we say that you can take two earthen pots okay outer one would be something like this shape the inner one would be a pot in which the water is to be kept here you will put some sand and you put water in this also you put water in this also here the water will remain cooler because of the sand and water and two earthen pots and you keep your insulin inside this water in a poly pack you wrap up with a Uh, polythene and tie and then you keep it so that the insulin is not contaminated because see if you're talking about all this i believe your patient is really a poor patient living in a rural area so he won't be using that uh, pens and all those he would be obviously using a syringe so that ampule of insulin is actually you have to poke into that and take insulin out so that the top area should not be contaminated that is why we ask them to keep it like that then 1400 i have already told you education like whether he has he is knowing all those things or not what to do in hypos what are hypos all those things then <clears throat> how many days he changes the needle in the syringe that i have told you then when he checks the sugar does he adjust insulin that is also very important thing and most of our doctors forget to discuss that they tell the patient okay you check your sugars but after checking what to do it's not just a customary to check the sugar you have to take some action right so that is important what he does what is his knowledge about doing like let's say my sugar is now 500 but i inject the same dose of insulin so it's not much useful that i am just checking sugar writing on the paper and bringing it after a month to the doctor okay so that is again very very important so <clears throat> indication of insulin this everybody of you would be knowing like type 1 we have to give insulin then in pregnancy most of the time in gdm we have to give surgery perioperative patients we have to give secondary oha failure actually there is no strict definition of secondary oha failure but uh, yes in those who are medicines are not working we have to give the insulin those patient who have ckd cld cld there are various issues because see these patient because the drugs are modified by the liver so the medicines is not pretty safe secondly glycogen storage is in liver those patient who have cirrhosis will have their glycogen storage less so when they will have hypo the sugars won't rise because the sugar rise uh, from uh, is from the uh, glycogen break but those glycogen storage is only not there in the ckd and cld patient because kidneys and uh, liver are the main source of glycogen okay so that is important infection sepsis in those patient who are critically ill patient in hospital patient so that all those things are totally different and uh, we cannot discuss within an hour it's a like a day session okay so i'll just skip that dkd hhs all those things we'll discuss later on and then in with the patient who are npo on tk all those require insulin you cannot give them oha right oral hypoglycemic agent should not be prescribed in all these types of patient so these are indications of insulin okay now this is again open question for every one of you in your practice when do you actually discuss regarding insulin for the first time with your patient when do you like obviously the patient is coming to maybe let's say he is newly diagnosed diabetes okay so when you actually discuss with him regarding insulin you can either come online or you can uh, reply on chat okay just we got one answer here that when sugars are not controlled with free ohs then we should discuss regarding insulin uh, till others are typing i'll just answer few questions here uh, we had a question when is 30 70 50 50 insulin is preferred okay i'll answer that also see just understand the ba basic thing and uh, this answer you will get uh, by yourself uh, dr ashwarya so <clears throat> 70 30 what does that mean actually here 70% is long acting i believe you are talking about mixtard and all those because now we have newer analog insulin also with these combinations but i am talking about the most commonly used those mixed rad or 30 70 pre mixes okay so here the 70% is actually nph and 30% is a regular conventional insulin whereas in 50 50 both are 50 nph 50 and 
regular insulin is also 50. So those patients who have, let's say, a lower carb meal, they will require a 3070, which is most commonly used in Indian scenarios because the longer acting here, I'll just draw, draw a graph. Let's say here, 8 a.m. the patient is eating something, then somewhere around 2 p.m. he is eating something, then something dinner he is having at 8 p.m. Okay. So what happens that when you give this 50-50, what will happen? 50% of the insulin will act a regular insulin which will be acting for somewhere around 4 to 6 hours whereas the 50% almost the same amount would be NPH and would be acting for 12 hours so something like that okay whereas in 30-70 what will happen a 30% a lower amount would be here and 70% would be something like that okay so something it depends on the meal pattern of the patient how much he is taking what is her uh, like a major meal like a patient who is taking very less at 2 p.m. and a major uh, uh, bulk of the food is at the breakfast, then he may require a 50-50 because you want more of regular insulin to cover that breakfast. So that is how we decide. It's not that one is to be preferred or one is better than the other. It depends on patient to patient. Okay, I hope that solves your query. If you have any further query, you can uh, type in chat box. Then... <clears throat> Okay, we have few answers here, like uh, after 3 OHA failure, when the sugars are erratic, after 5 to 10 years of diabetes, when the patient is admitted, and, uh, and one answer we have, when the HbA1c is more than 10 and blood sugars are more than 300, we have to discuss regarding insulin. In case of type 1, obviously, it's like we have to discuss, not we have to start initiate insulin right from the beginning. So with type 1, even with a good glycemic control, it's not like uh, you, it's already the patient would be on insulin okay so that is okay and then most of you answered that whenever the sugars are uncontrolled and whenever the OHS are not working that is one and pregnant female okay that is good enough see actually if you talk about the guidelines and if you talk about the expert opinion you have to discuss insulin right at the beginning at the beginning are you getting that at the beginning whenever see <coughs> All these diabetic patients will actually require insulin some or other time. So it should be discussed right in the beginning that your diabetes will come, you will they will come when you will have to be on insulin. This this way actually he will not be frightened of insulin. He would be more compliant to your therapy and he would be accepting. He would be willing to accept this insulin whenever his sugars go bad. Okay. So ideally, it should be discussed right at the beginning, at the time of diagnosis itself. But see, I believe that is what the experts are saying. But again, this is your personal judgment depending on the patient. Let's say a patient is already very anxious because he was fine yesterday. Now he has developed diabetes. So already he's thinking, I'll have this, I will have all those complications. And he's already frightened. So that time it is very difficult to discuss all those things. That time you, uh, you must be as soothing as possible for the patient. But usually it is recommended to discuss insulin right at the beginning or at least within two, three visits. You have to tell your patient that a day would come when you would be requiring insulin. Okay. So that is important and that way the patient would be more compliant. Okay. Now, have you heard the word about insulin distress and what should be done to overcome that. Okay, very nice question we have from, uh, I know uh, the name of the doctor is not there. Earlier starting insulin, you just type about the insulin distress, I'll answer in that uh, the previous questions. So earlier starting insulin will give rest to remaining beta cell, delay the onset of complication. Okay, so this is a very important theory, not very well proven. And it was thought that if you initiate insulin right at the beginning, without initiating OHA, this may further help in beta cell preservation. So there are some data which shows that if you initiate insulin within three months, then uh, the OHAs may act better. And uh, onset of complication, we don't have such as such data, but yes, beta cell preservation, we have some data, but not very robust data. 
and secondly i believe most of our patient would not be willing to initiate insulin right at the beginning and now we have data in for wilda glyptin especially if you'll go by this verified trial there is a verified trial just read it this is a really good trial here what they've shown that if you initiate wilda glyptin and metformin right in the beginning then the need for adding a second drug and a third drug is delayed so that is something which shows that in, uh, initiating these two drugs can help uh, in preservation of beta cell and regarding the delay in complication see delay in complication depends on the glycemic control better glycemic control the lesser complication and we have this legacy effect or the metabolic memory okay so legacy effect and metabolic memory what does that say that is from uk pds trial that says that if the sugars are controlled better in the earlier phase rather than later phase like if let's say there is a group of patient whose sugars were better controlled at initial 10 years but not that controlled after 10 years versus a group whose sugars were not controlled initially 10 years but better controlled at after that 10 years so at 20 years both the group have spent 10 years in good glycemic controls and 10 years in bad glycemic control but those patients who have better glycemic control at initial 10 years will have lesser complication that is well proven in the trial that is what is called as legacy effect okay okay so this this is like way beyond discussion but yes their uh, antibodies to insulin are you develop sometimes and then it becomes very difficult to manage now we have a complete uh, i would say it's a complete different topic to discuss that is way beyond so sometimes what we do is the usual uh, is we try to change the insulin and most of the time it works but we have seen patient who don't respond to at all to any of this but uh, this subcutaneous insulin but they respond to the iv insulin so that is insulin antibody so there are some studies which shows that you can go for the <clears throat> steroid plasma pharesis all those uh, and then uh, steroid sparing immunosuppressants so there are some uh, data for this but actually it depends on patient to patient and uh, it is really tough even for us to manage these kinds of patient and those patient if you will see develops antibody in fact many of uh, now we have literature which shows that antibodies are developed but usually they don't have much effect and the patient does not need any treatment change okay <clears throat> one important question has been asked here that type 1 in uh, patient 50 50 or 30 70 nothing please don't go for this premix in type 1 you have to go for basal bolus nothing 50 50 nothing 30 70 no premix just go for basal bolus okay so insulin distress nobody have answered see this is actually when to initiate insulin the distress of the patient is what is insulin distress okay the that is why he is unwilling because he is not comfortable to initiate insulin right so that is insulin distress so what you have to do you have to listen that is the acronym listen to the patient by listen l is list patient concern why he does not want insulin what are her, his or her fear that what is the problem that he don't want to initiate insulin first is that then i is information you have to give correct evidence based information because see some uh, that we have discussed like patient have a belief that whenever he initiate insulin uh, he may develop more complication and in my part of like uh, i work in mp bhopal so yahan pe jo patient aate hain wo bolte aadat ho jayegi that is a common slang they use that this will become their habit so we have to make them understand that it's not a habit you require insulin and we are not going to wean you off of insulin because now you require that so that is something important information correct information and medically correct evidence based information 
that is important s is stand for support you have to support the patient rather than shouting or saying because you are so obese you don't follow diet because you are eating too many sweets so all those things you have to tell okay then team work it's not a single person work to have uh, this you have to have a team you have to keep on board the patient also yourself also dietitian also diabetic educator also so it should be a team work okay then empathy that is really important because what i see before initiating insulin this is just before i'm talking about what happens that the doctor says to the patient most of the time if you don't follow diet i will put you on insulin so it's used as a stick to make his lifestyle better that should not be done because anyhow the patient will be on insulin maybe after a year or maybe after 10 years but he would be on insulin so please don't use insulin as a stick to make his daily routine a better that is a big problem so that you have to see that if this brings a very negative message and then the patient is not uh, willing to initiate insulin so that is to be taken then neutral non judgmental communication that is important you have don't judge the patient that he is not going to take or he is going to take or he will do this or that just be straight forward and just keep yourself in the place of patient and then this would be really easy to initiate and manage that patient okay now coming to the basics of initiation before that if you have any question we have almost like half way through and it's already one hour any question okay we have some this uh, clinical question here a patient comes with a random sugar of 500 and uh, family history is unknown and c peptide and anti get would take 24 hours to 48 hours then how to manage the patient refuses for the insulin or admission so what all oh should be considered okay so that that's a common clinical uh, context i would say and really good question put up by dr subarna okay so see what are you suspecting one important thing which every doctor misses out is diagnosis whenever any patients come with high sugar you label the patient as type 2 dm that is again a big big problem you don't think that what all he can have whether he has this type 1 okay even you think about type 1 and type 2 you go don't go beyond that like whether he has steroid induced diabetes or he has this pancreatic diabetes fcpd ccpd or acromegaly or cushing's all those things we have to taken into consideration secondly whether this is just a single report and a reliable report or not okay let's sort it out that everything has been done and now let's say the patient is morbidly obese with a bmi of say 33 30 um, like not morbidly obese morbid obese definition is about 40 so let's say the bmi of patient is 33 or 35 so he is obese patient for sure and probably he is type 2 dm he has acanthosis all those clinical context is there most of the time we'll get those patients only and now he has sugars of 500 so and let's say he is recently diagnosed young patient and drug name do you want to admit is there any indication of admission usually there is no uh, indication of admission in these type of patient what i do in my clinical practice is i get a blood ketone directly at that time if the ketones are negative mostly they are negative only because these patient have insulin higher insulin resistance they have insulin because you can see the acanthosis and all those so you don't even need c peptide it's like that okay and anti gain is usually required when you are suspecting type 1 so obese patient with 500 sugar drug name you can initiate oha and give him time and monitor and usually this recovers it's not that you have to initiate insulin that is a common clinical problem let guideline says different thing but in clinical practice you can definitely go for this not a issue will the metformin given after food yes you can give it not a issue you can success is to raise of your patients okay that will try to do that okay uh, dr arul want 50 50 versus uh, 30 70 
so we'll discuss it later on because i have already discussed uh, i believe the video would be available uh, how we decide how many insulin unit would be given i have, i'm coming to that brittle diabetes okay we'll discuss that also okay there are few more questions i'll take later on just we'll start with this initiation and then we'll have this question session again so initiation of insulin you can do three ways one is a basal insulin one is with a premix one is with a basal bolus okay which is the best best is obviously a basal bolus where you give four or five times insulin one time or two time would be a basal insulin usually one time and with every meal you give boluses because it is best because it mimics the physiology it has better control but the patient would have more hypos can have more hypos then your basal insulin this is usually what and how we initiate and that is what the most guidelines is i'm coming to that so here you have once daily insulin injection usually is initiated at night it is very simple very easy to initiate very easy to titrate and the patient has less hypos premix is something between these two basal and basal bolus it is relatively easy and uh, it does not exactly mimic physiology but it is better than the basal in mimicking physiology but it is difficult to adjust because one insulin you will increase the other insulin would also increase if you increase the basal bolus will also increase if you increase the bolus basal will also increase because it's a premix already mixed insulin is being taken by the patient okay now i'll just tell you some basic things basal bolus what happens see here this basal insulin is actually it it's not as straight as shown in this uh, diagram so this keeps a almost constant level of insulin okay that is basal insulin but the patient is taking breakfast lunch and dinner where he would require some insulin or he may not require him it may be controlled with oha also so usually what we do when we initiate the insulin we keep him on a basal insulin plus some ohs so this is very important question which has been asked by, uh, to me many times that when we initiate basal insulin should we switch off or should we remove this ohs definitely not definitely not because basal insulin will not cover your this breakfast lunch and dinner sugar speak okay so you should not remove your ohs and when you initiate a basal insulin first let that that should be clear in your mind okay then you have this prandial insulin which covers the well, this are the bolus okay <clears throat> so this covers the meals the lunch dinner breakfast all those and depending on how much amount he is taking how, how much calorie he is taking what is the carbohydrate in that not only the calorie how much carbohydrate that is even more important that is taken into consideration so accordingly we decide the prandial insulin or the bolus insulin so in all basal bolus would be something like that that basal once he would be taking or twice at max and bolus he would be taking at least uh two or three times or sometimes even four times also we give sometimes the patient has a snack at the 5 pm usually in type 1 we give five times insulin where one would be a basal and four time would be bolus so this mimics the physiology and it is the best regime but what is the problem the patient has to prick four or five times so it's not very convenient that is the problem okay now this is <clears throat> regarding the basal insulin so this is glargin if you see here we have injected somewhere here 9 pm post dinner the patient had dinner at 8 pm and we have injected at 10 pm uh, the glargin so this starts to rise and it will uh, at 12 pm it again rises and here it is uh, when it is steeping down we have again injected the second dose okay so this is glargin okay you can see here then this is nph what well, usually nph is given twice a day because it has a uh, duration almost like 12 hours so here you will see if i have injected it somewhere at 10 pm this works somewhere around 10 or 12 and then it does not work okay so that is nph insulin 
and when you initiate a basal insulin with a premix sometimes that is also done but that's not a good choice here the premix is given at dinner just before dinner because see in premix there would be regular insulin as well so you cannot give after meals otherwise the patient will have hypo you have to give it before meal so here in these two places i have given post dinner diagram here you will see before dinner it was taken so it covered that dinner uh, part and then there was nph the 3070 and this acted till almost like 10 almost for 12 hours so this is a premix insulin initiated as a basal insulin but usually we don't prefer that okay this is again premix what i was talking about the premix 3070 given twice so here you will see that before breakfast it is given and before dinner it is given so it will cover the breakfast peak it will cover the dinner peak but this lunch peak is there so sometimes what happen 3070 at breakfast 3070 at dinner and a rapid acting insulin in lunch time that is also given but <clears throat> see what i believe when you are already pricking the patient with three times now you have given 3070 twice and once you have given a regular insulin that means you have already pricked the patient three times so why not to prick at four times then you can give him a basal bolus regime with that four time what would his sugars would be controlled better when you are already pricking three times it does not make much difference if you prick him one more time okay so four times would be much better than giving this regimen also he will have that flexibility let's say today i want to eat today the breakfast is very good i want to eat more then i can increase my insulin i can do my carb counting so that flexibility you will give with a basal bolus but here with 30 70 you cannot give that flexibility because if you will increase the 30 part the 70 part will also increase so patient will have more of nph so that flexibility you cannot give and what you are doing just you are saving one prick so it's not actually a very good regime but i see in and out patient being prescribed this regime so personally this is not what i would prefer okay so what exactly the guideline says regarding insulin initiation so if you will go by ada guideline ada says you have to initiate with a basal insulin previously they said you can initiate with a premix also or a basal insulin also but now if you see recently whether you talk about idf rssdi ace american association or ada okay all this says you have to initiate with a basal insulin previously premix was also there in the guideline but at present only our rssdi esi 2019 guideline that is the latest edition says that you can either initiate with a basal insulin or a premix and for that they have given one logical reason also they say that our patients the indian patients have more carbohydrate in their diet so we can initiate with a premix thereby we will cover that uh, peak which is due to the meal the patient is taking usually carb in our patients diet is consist of somewhere around 80% it varies from 70 to 85 so 80% is something carbohydrate content the overall calorie which comes from the carbohydrate in the meal is something around 80% so that is our indian diet that is why this rssdi consensus has come with that you can initiate with a premix but in clinical practice usually we initiate with a basal insulin only and that is what the most guideline says okay this is from the guideline two three important points i want to say see we, i cannot discuss all, everything this lecture would go for four hours otherwise okay so here the first thing is obviously lsm lifestyle modification then followed by metformin then you have to see whether the patient has acvd or ckd established acvd acvd risk factor and thereby you have to decide whether you have to give a glp1 or a glt2 inhibitor if the sugars are not controlled with the one you have to add the other let's just skip all those things then what you should do then you have to give a basal insulin maybe it's not visible you can go and see this guideline so here you will see here that they clearly mention you have to initiate with a basal insulin one more important thing i uh, stress here because we are talking about insulin if the patient has high risk of hypoglycemia let's all those drugs i am not going into details but if the patient has this hypoglycemia here they have written clearly 
consider a basal insulin with a lower risk of hyperglycemia. What do we mean by that? Lower risk of hyperglycemia is with a second generation basal insulin, what I was talking about, Degludec or a U300, that is 2GO or uh, this Presiva that should be given to this patient. This is what the guideline says. Okay. And one more important point, before even like <clears throat> there would be weight gain with the insulin, most of our patients are obese. So for injectable therapy, especially those who have this ACVD risk factors, by ACVD risk factors, I mean that patient has dyslipidemia or patient has this uh, urine microalbumin positive or patient has hypertension. Okay, so all those patients actually should be put on injectable GLP-1 prior to an injectable insulin. Okay, so that is something you have to keep in mind. That is something that has changed over recent years. Okay, so the question is how do you decide how to start this basal insulin? We are talking about this because uh, just now we have seen that we will start with the basal insulin. So how do you decide how much you need to give? You can put in question answer session, uh, this chat box. <coughs> okay, so we have one question. Is uh, rational for starting SGLT2 inhibitors early in patient who may not require two urges? So as to prevent delay progression of diabetes. No, we don't have such data that uh, this will uh, delay the progression of diabetes. But yes, there is a strong compelling indication to initiate SGLT2 inhibitors, those who have heart failure. Even those patients who are non-diabetic but have heart failure, they SGLT2 inhibitors are actually indicated, leave apart whether the patient has diabetes or not. So SGLT2 inhibitors are to be given where even when the patient is very well controlled uh, with just say metformin, HBNC is pretty good, whatever you have targeted, everything, then also SGLT2 inhibitors are to be initiated, but that's not to delay the progression of diabetes. And same way in those patients who have DKD, there is compulsion that you have to initiate SGLT2 inhibitor because that uh, delay of complication of just CKD, that is well proven. But overall diabetes progression, if you will talk about, it's not proven. Okay. Uh, one question, I believe this is an MCQ question, in which patient you will not have an uh, intensive glycemic control? In autonomic neuropathy, we don't want to go uh, intensive glycemic control because these patients will not have symptoms of hypoglycemia and he may land up into severe hypoglycemia, whereas those patients who have any infected, whether you talk about diabetic foot or sepsis or all those, so you want a better glycemic control. Newly diagnosed type 2 middle way as men, the same uh, thing I've talked about uh, this legacy effect and all those gestational diabetes, obviously the control is even stricter. If you talk about gestational diabetes, the <clears throat> fasting should be 60 to 95 post uh, prandial. One hour should be less than 140. Two hour post prandial should be less than 120. These are the targets what we want. Okay. Okay, this is one really good question here. Glargin BD have an advantage over Glargin OD? Usually we don't uh, give Glargin BD, it's just a OD, but if the dose are beyond uh, 30 or 40 units, which most of your patient won't have, then we split up into BD, okay? And then there is some theory that if you give BD, even you will have more peakless effect, but that's not very well proven thing. So, in practicality, there is not much advantage of giving insulin, uh, insulin glargin or say Lantus BD over OD. Okay. Mixed start 3070 TDS should not be given, but uh, sometimes these uh, VC patients get, getting this uh, 3070 thrice. Uh, we have one question here. So let's discuss that also. So if <clears throat> you have this, if you are given uh, this insulin at breakfast, this is rapid, this is NPH. Then again in the afternoon, you have given a rapid and NPH 
would be there 30 70 and again at dinner a rapid and a, a long acting so this long acting will be very high and the patient will have hypos should not be given like this way so thrice 30 70 is not to be prescribed what you can do is 30 70 twice and regular in the middle that is at lunch that you can do but again as we have discussed it is better than to go for a basal pulse okay we'll take uh, questions later on again so what is the starting dose of insulin how do you decide that so basically it depends on the insulin resistance if the patient is obese we start at a higher dose if the patient is lean and thin we start at a lower dose so this paper is published in 2019 please go through that be smart these are early strategies to maximize hpmc reduction with oral therapy okay this is from indian uh, group expert opinion so see here <coughs> what they say either you can initiate at 10 units per day or you can initiate at 0.1 to 0.2 unit per kg per day so let's say a patient is 50 kg okay so you can start somewhere between 5 to 10 units or 8 units is usually what I do at a 50 kg patient. But let's say a patient is obese. Okay, a patient weighing say 112 kgs. Okay, so even with that 0.1, it would be somewhere around 11 and 12. But we usually go more than that and we go up to 20 units also. Okay, right at the beginning because the patient is obese his insulin resistance is high okay so for obese patients sometimes even we go 0.3 also but the this is what is the recommendation 0.1 to 0.2 unit okay then how do you adjust that is again important you have initiated insulin now how to make changes in the doses so that depends on fasting sugars okay now, fasting sugars target are different for different population. Let's say a patient have too many complications. So, you will slightly relax his fasting and glycemic control, his HbA1c, his targets would be relaxed. A young patient, you would want him not to develop complication. That is why his glycemic control should be much stricter. Okay. So, his fasting target would be lower. So, depending on whatever you have decided, for most of our patients, fasting would be somewhere around 80 to 130 and not beyond 140. So what we say, till the blood sugars are reached at 140, you have to increase every third day two units. That is very simple thing. Or second way what you can do is you can take the average of three days. Let's say the patient has first day 200 and another day he had 100, something like that and third day he had 120 or let's uh, make it opposite uh, patient at first day 100 120 then 200 so you should not increase insulin here because see the 200 maybe because he had ate at last night something outside a very heavy meal so all those things should be taken into consideration so what we do is either we ask him whenever uh, till 140 it is reached you increase two days or what we do we take the average of the three okay or we take the lowest of the three that is the third method what we do like in this patient he had this 100 120 and 200 so lowest would be 100 that means whatever you are giving is good enough please don't increase so all those three methods are used for titration the titration means increasing the dose of basal insulin okay intensification intensification means you have to add a bolus to the basal regimen so uh, this um, when actually do you want to do intensify so when you have reached two point units per kg per day and still the sugars are not controlled the fasting is not controlled that means you have to intensify you have to add a bolus either you can add a single bolus two bolus or three bolus that would again become a basal bolus so bo that is called basal plus basal plus two or basal bolus okay so that is one 
another than that if the fastings are controlled but the pps are not controlled then also you need to intensify the treatment these are two things we take into consideration okay then there <laughs> is this bam calculation 50 all those i am not going into detail but there are many things which we look okay now again a question why do you titrate this basal insulin based on fasting not insulin blood sugar fasting blood sugars okay anybody want to answer or uh, want to come live can come why are we targeting based on the fasting till that i'll answer few more questions see uh, one question is regarding rhizodeg so rhizodeg is nothing it is also a 3070 where 70 is Reciba and thirty is S part. Okay, so it is something similar to that. And when the patient has this uh, major meal two three times, again you don't give risodec twice a day. You again you have to give twice a day or once a day, and other would be covered by a short acting. That is what the guideline also says. If you go by all those papers with uh, this risodec, they also say this only. But important thing here, what is with the risodec, but with not with the premix, is because this tracyba is very long acting. It's not NPH; it will act only for twelve hours. And I've told you that this tracyba gives you the flexibility that even you can uh, like change the timing of the insulin. So similarly, risodec. Let's say. i am not eating because today uh, i have a party at night that is why i am eating very less in the morning and usually i take my risodec in the morning so what i can do for today i don't take my risodec in the morning and i'll take it night when i want to enjoy the meal okay so that can be done that is well proven okay okay this is a very good question here do we need insulin in all those patients whose hbnc is about 10 okay guideline says if you talk about different guidelines if you their ada says if hbnc is more than 10% you should consider insulin aac says if, if you have the patient already on oha and hbnc is more than 7.5 you can consider insulin if the patient is not on oha and hbnc is more than 9% you should consider insulin and rssdi says somewhere around i believe 8.5% that is what i remember not sure for rssdi but yes these are the ada cutoffs and aca cutoffs that is what is said but again this depends on how the patient is living what oha is on if the patient is only on say lifestyle modification he is drug naive and his hbnc is 10 he would be controlled with oh even we see patients whose uh, hbnc is 12 13 and they are drug naive they respond to oh so it's not <clears throat> a strict rule that if the sugars are like say hbnc 12% 30% this patient will require insulin that is not the rule okay this is again very important question multiple oh to insulin how to shift so that again depends on what oh is the patients are and what insulin you are using whether you are just initiating a basal insulin or you are giving him a basal bolus so if you are giving a basal bolus usually secretogox are removed like uh, all those uh, glimepride glicazide glipizide all those we don't give because we consider this patient have already exhausted the beta cell these are secondary ohs failure so you need not give those patients secretogox but you can use insulin sensitizers like the metformin the pyoglitazone you can use sglt2 inhibitors you can use glp1 analogs the incretin based therapies okay dpp4 inhibitors but secretogox are to be removed then okay b12 deficiency yes metformin causes that has a guideline also that it uh, you need to measure b12 that is clearly mentioned in ada also and now we have this combinations also metformin uh, tablets comes with b12 okay further question i will take later on so why are these basal insulin titrated on the basic of this basis of this fasting insulin so 
this is the concept here fff first fix fasting okay this is the concept so you see here higher hbnc you go okay so the higher hbnc you go beyond 10% it is the fasting insulin which is actually responsible for that hbnc if you talk about the lower hbnc 6 to 7% here the fasting and pp equally contribute to your hbnc so higher the hbnc more component would be for the fasting insulin uh, sorry fasting blood sugars so fasting blood sugars are to be managed first that is the concept and that is why we are adjusting this based on your basal insulin okay and for postprandial you have this bolus titration i have already discussed we can just leave it all those things i have told you you can increase by two units till the sugars you can take the average of the three or you can take lower lower most uh, reading of the three days or oh, everything is okay okay which basal insulin would you prefer whether you would prefer a uh, nph detimer glargin u100 u300 or deglutec what uh, do you want okay we are uh, running slightly late already it's in 130 uh, one hour 30 minutes have passed i'll just quickly tell you so see nph usually is not preferred as a basal insulin because the duration of action is just 12 hours detimer is usually preferred in pregnancy because we have data that uh, this is better you can prefer any of the three insulin as a basal insulin u100 uh, usually the lentus you will see or the Besalog or Besaglar, all those Glaritas, U300 you can prefer, this is slightly better, these two are second generation, Degludec you can prefer, Tresipa, these are slightly better, you can even prefer in IPDs patient who are going for surgeries or who are admitted with uh, some acute sickness where the dietary pattern is not that good, but they should be eating. Okay, if the patient is NPO or is not eating, it's better to go for a infusion, regular insulin infusion or a neutralizing prep rather than preferring a subcute insulin. Okay, don't prefer subcute in them, those who are not eating. So these are the three insulin you can prefer. This would be slightly cheaper. These are slightly costlier and this is the costliest one in these three. Okay, so this also depends on the affordability of the patient also because whatever insulin you are giving, it is going to be like, he's going to take a bit. It's not like he'll stop it after a month. Okay. What time of the day would you prefer basal insulin? Okay. Now, again, this depends on what basal insulin you are taking. If you talk about the Treciba, you can give it any time. doesn't have anything to do. With the major meal, obviously, it doesn't make sense because basal insulin has this peakless effect. It works for more than 24 hours or up to 24 hours. So, it does not make sense. Before breakfast, nothing to do with food. You can give it any time, the basal insulin. There are theories that uh, some prefers in morning, some prefer at night because some says that in the morning you will give the next morning, or let's say I've given at 8 a.m. Then the next day, next day 4 a.m., the effect of the basal insulin would be weaning so the patient will have less of nocturnal hypoglycemia so some of us prefer at morning whereas some of us prefer at night because thereby you can better adjust the fasting blood sugars so both is okay okay and nothing to do with the food major meal breakfast nothing to do with that <coughs> okay which insulin can be given at varying time of the day? We have discussed n number of times. It's degludec, the highest flexibility you have. Then with the U300, you will have a flexibility of around, let's say, three hours. With U100, you will have a flexibility of around 30 minutes. Okay. This is regarding the intensification. Okay. So this is, we are coming to the last part. So here, this is from AACE. Okay. AACE. You see here, if HbA1c is less than 
already on OHA, then also you can initiate, but usually the patient won't be willing. So here we'll discuss just the long acting. If HVNC is more than 8% and the patient is on OHA, you can start with 0.2 to 0.3 unit. That is what the most of the uh, say. And this is about the basal insulin, okay? And after that, if the sugars are still not controlled, glycemia not met, then you have to intensify, okay? You have to add a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2 inhibitor or a DPP-4 inhibitor. That is what I was saying that secretogox should not be given, but other than that, you can give. If still the sugars are not controlled, you can go for basal plus one, plus two or base plus three. Plus three is that is the basal bolus. Okay. Now, how to start that basal bolus? Let's say the patient was on, um, say, 30 units of basal insulin and still the blood sugars were not controlled. Now you want to switch to basal bolus. What, what options do you have? Either you can go for basal bolus or you can go for premix. But premix usually we don't prefer, but there are uh, how to do that. That is also there. But I'll just tell you about the basal bolus. Okay. So if you want to convert this basal bolus, whatever the total daily dose of the insulin is there, or if the patient you have directly initiate a basal bolus, let's say the, these two are different things, then what you can do is you can calculate with 0.3 to 0.5 that you can give uh, as a total daily dose and you can convert into 50% as a bolus and 50% as a basal and out of this 50% bolus which is a short acting two third in the morning and one third in the evening that is what you can do okay so that one regime you can follow this okay another regime what you can do is if the patient is already on the basal insulin okay so whatever amount he is on the basal insulin and you want to add plus one let's say you have to add just a bolus once a day with the major meal so what you can do you can either give 10 percent of this or you can initiate with five units that is what the guideline says so usually somewhere around five to six unit is what we start with a basal plus one that means with usually in indian scenario it is the lunch which the patient is taking as a major meal. So we give a bolus at the lunch and we continue basal after dinner. That is what we do. Okay. So this is how to intensify. And again, it depends on, I'll tell you in next few slides, upon the blood sugar levels that how to titrate this basal bolus regime. Okay. One important question. What do you think? How much blood sugar is dropped with one unit of insulin? This is again open to all. Till that I'll take few more questions till you're re replying. Okay, one question is why priming is done. Priming is done to sometimes what happens that there is air in the, uh, the syringe or the pen. So if you don't prime, what will happen that air would be injected and the patient will receive less units of insulin. That is why priming is to be done. Okay, one question by Dr. Karan was roller coaster mechanism of insulin. Okay, so roller coaster effect is seen in sliding scale that I have not discussed. Actually, this is now uh, this is not used. Sliding scale. You see the blood sugars and accordingly you give the regular insulin. That is what happened in most of the hospitals. There you will see like that uh, something uh, regime is written. That if 150 to 200 sugars, you give two units of regular insulin, then 200 to say 250, then you give four units, something like that. A scale is written here. That is called sliding scale. And here, the roller coaster mechanism of insulin effect is seen because <clears throat> I'll again explain with a diagram here. What happens? Let's say a patient ate in breakfast something, and at that time, his sugars was 222 you have given him four units of regular insulin, which acted upon uh, for next four to six hours. In lunch, his sugars was 132. This is just an example. So 132 falls below this, your sliding scale. So you have omitted the regular insulin, but the patient had his lunch. Now what happened due to this lunch, his sugars will peak 
but this prior regular insulin has already weaned off so it's not acting anymore that is why his sugar will again rise now what happened at dinner you again checked sugar and it was 305 so whatever your regime was let's say it was somewhere around uh, 250 to 306 unit and more than 300 you have written 8 units so it was more than 35 the sister gave again 8 units of regular insulin now what will happen this because he is having dinner so some sugars would rise but this insulin was very high and he had hypo okay so this is roller coaster effect highs and low would be keep on going because this sliding is kept so this is not to be used okay so we have various answers here somebody said 30 25 to 30 30 40 8 something like that and somebody said they are depending on the patient depending on the absorption depending on the resistance okay so <clears throat> so we have a formula for that also one unit of insulin actually if you talk about initiation nobody can say that how much insulin how much sugar will drop with one unit of insulin but if the patient is already on insulin then we have a formula this is 1800 <coughs> by tdd that is total daily days of uh, total daily dose of insulin so if the patient is on 60 units 30 units of basal 30 unit of basal okay basal bolus 30 30 total 8 uh, 60 units so that means 1800 by 60 that means 30 so for that patient one unit of insulin will drop blood sugars by 30 and this is very important because let's say his sugars were more um, your target was 140 and his sugars was 200 that means if you will give two units extra insulin this 60 would be covered so that is the importance of this calculation and let's say the patient is only on 30 units of insulin so 1800 by 30 that means 60 so here in this patient who is requiring lesser amount of insulin one unit will drop more the blood sugar would be drop much higher with one unit so that this formula itself take into consideration all those resistance things okay so this is important to know that how to calculate and thereby you will adjust so this sliding scale is not to be used but correction scale is to be used okay correction scale is like if i'll put it on next slide so let's say if the patient was on say lentus you have prescribed him lentus you have to take 20 units and let's say you have talked uh, regular insulin anything ectrapid was one question here so i put ectrapid ectrapid you said uh, you take something like say 10 6 and 4 whatever some regime you have put okay so this is the regime we have given to our patient so this is total 50 units okay Uh, not 50 40 units these are 40 units 20 this and 20 this so our patient is on 40 units of insulin and now let's say his sugar set uh, these are some readings his uh, breakfast reading was 151 his pre lunch was somewhere 222 so what happened this at 222 he was usually taking 6 units but with this 6 unit this will not drop okay so we give them a correction dose something similar to like this after calculation with this tdd okay and we have to under correct that so 1800 by this 40 so this uh, would be somewhere around <clears throat> more than 40 drop would be there almost 50 drop would be there with one unit of insulin in this patient so we slightly under correct not exactly 50 so if we want to make it <clears throat> let's say we want to correct it our target was somewhere around 120 so we have uh, almost 100 drop we need okay so two unit extra we should give for that patient so that is what is told okay so that is correction dose this is not a sliding scale sliding scale you actually miss insulin if the sugars are normal here you have to give something the regime is already prefixed and on that you correct that is called correction dose okay so correction is to be done sliding scale is not to be used 
again how many time you should monitor blood sugar this is again an open question till that i'll answer few more question you can just uh, put the chat box <coughs> how many times to monitor blood sugar what do you think a patient on basal bolus uh, we have a question here that the fasting is good bp is high that means the 8886 and 18 you are giving that means the 18 is sufficient because his fasting had come to normal so whatever you are giving this uh, boluses are not actually matching with the uh, his uh, meal so you have to increase the bolus not the basal insulin okay okay dr subanna has replied six times dr golu has replied continuously okay so see obviously the more you monitor the merrier it would be the better it would be it depends on what the patient is taking if let's say patient is only on metformin then once a month is also good enough but we are talking about here insulin basal bolus so ideally it should be more times seven times a day all the pre and post breakfast lunch dinner that is six times and 2 am that would be really good but what's the bare minimum you would need their minimum is four times okay you would need pre meals all that is breakfast before breakfast before lunch before dinner and after dinner now there is logic to this also that why do you need four times see on the basal bolus i'm talking about basal bolus okay so with the breakfast you would know how to adjust the basal okay before breakfast that's the fasting thing you need then only you would be able to adjust that night time bolus oh, sorry night time basal insulin which you are giving one time okay so that can be adjusted only by seeing the fasting blood sugars so that that is the bare minimum and depending on this what is his fasting sugar you will also decide how much be, uh, bolus insulin you have to give short acting prandial insulin you have to give then before lunch this will again help you to decide that whether the breakfast insulin whatever you gave that was okay or not let's say the breakfast blood sugar was 130 like one question was put and after 2 hours it was 370 which you have not checked but this will also reflect in your before lunch because after, if after 2 years it is 2 uh, hours it is raised then it would be raised even before lunch also so this before lunch actually helps us to decide that after 2 hours what would be the sugar but it would not be exact exact would be after 2 hours you would have monitored but again you have to prick the patient to get the blood sugars for many times if you want then every time the patient would prick otherwise cgms is something which is really important we'll have a session complete session one and a half hour for cgms i'm not going because that cannot be discussed here that's again a one and a half hour session okay we'll discuss later on so depending on this before lunch we'll have a some idea that what would be two hours after breakfast similarly before dinner this will help us how much insulin you have to inject at the dinner and also this will give you an idea what would be two hours after lunch so this would act as a surrogate marker for that now why do you need after dinner because now you are not going to inject insulin after dinner is also very important after dinner should not be less than 120 because if it is less than 120 then probably this patient is going into hypo at 2 am so if you want exact then you will need a blood sugar reading at 2 am but this after dinner will help us to estimate whether the patient will land up into hypo nocturnal hypoglycemia or not so this is the bare minimum i would need to adjust my insulin doses in a basal bolus four times in a day is actually the bare minimum which is required to adjust the doses okay so how to adjust the doses of the uh, bolus insulin i have already told you what is the correction doses and what what exactly we see in pre and post like let's say pre uh, breakfast and post breakfast what should be difference so difference should be of 50 uh, 50 mg blood sugar should raise that is normally if it is raising more than that that means whatever regular insulin you have given here that was not actually enough to match with the amount of food taken by your patient okay 